thank you, Lord, for bringing us together this fine morning. We appreciate you, Heavenly Father, every good thing that you've done in our life. Among them, the gift of health, the gift of breath, dear Heavenly Father, and the gift of knowing you. In your presence, we request you, Heavenly Father, to be with us, that you may instruct our hearts, dear Heavenly Father, to listen to your word, and accordingly so, that you may be effective in our hearts. Humble us, O Lord, that any obstruction may be obscured from us, O Lord. Pray this shall be believing and trusting in Jesus' holy name. Let us have our seats. Praise God again. I hope you're well. Happy Jamuhuri Day. Happy Jamuhuri Day. Um, my name is David Coimbori. I'm pleased to be in the Lord this fine morning. I'm super grateful for this privilege also to be sharing the word of God. Such moments are quite rare, and I take them with a lot of uh, a bit of pride and also with a lot of humbleness. Um, today's sermon would be titled "Just Do It." Just do it. Yoni moto ya ya ni Nike, Nike, Nike. Just do it, huh? And it will be inspired from the two sermons that we read. We took one from Zephaniah, and we took another from Luke. Luke chapter 3, verse um, 7 to, to 20. Yes. Um, I'm not sure how to do this. There are two ways we can do this. We could start with a big picture, go down to the small picture, or we start with a small picture and work ourselves up. Huh? Um, now, in summary, I'll just give a, I'll go back and forth. Small picture, big picture, big picture, small picture. Um, I just want to emphasize the portions that I'll be getting inspiration for the for the sermon. And the basic summary in Luke, and even in Zephaniah, is basically about repentance and the fact that we shall not use the people that are ahead of us or the people who are rightfully so sanctified to claim to lay a claim on salvation without putting in the hard work. So John the Baptist is basically, in fact, the title is prepares the way, and that is preparing the way for Christ. So Christ, uh, John the Baptist is preparing the way for Christ by, by uh, con uh, requesting people, or rather convincing uh, people that they should first repent before they can lay a claim on salvation. And the same thing happens in uh, Zephaniah, more or less, we're talking about salvation. Now, as we work ourselves to the big picture, I hope to do a quick presentation as, um, by presenting uh, the way of being as a pattern. And I'll do this by uh, starting or inferring to the creation, and I'll infer a few patterns as a mode of being, as a universal mode of being. And why I've carried this trick is because yeah, this is my prop for the day. And I'm hoping to use a pattern like uh, a fractal pattern. And a fractal pattern is, for example, how things are distributed, and it's a natural way of distributing things. For example, as I'm standing, if you look at me, generally speaking, I am one unit, right? But if you look closer to me, I have, I am five units. Two hands, two legs, one head, and if you zoom in a bit closer, my hand, you can tell the same arm that has now been branched out from this one unit has now five branches, right? The tree also is something like that. You have the stem that goes up into a branch, two branches, three branches. And if you zoom in a bit closer, you have a branch that has smaller branches, twigs, and the twigs have leaves. And so you have this mode of dispersion from one unit, branching out, and so on and so forth. And the beauty of this is that you'll find this in almost every aspect of nature. And I hope to present being as such, a pattern of being, from creation down to the basic way of living, which is what I'm calling the big picture and the small picture, okay? So let us start with creation. I always start, I always like, um, go in full circle with my reading so that um, because the things are not isolated the teachings that we get from the bible are not isolated in any way 
is uh, like a hyperlinked, uh, a hyperlinked document. So from the creation, from the very beginning of creation, what we understand when the first two lines of creation are, let me just read them. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of, of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And this is an age-old question. Um, we always ask, who created God? Or how is it that God was in the beginning before everything else? Because you have the notion that everything must have a beginning, you know? But I post to you that that is not even the most important question, or else, the thing that has a better implication is the understanding of this. For God to be able to create the world, you must understand that the nature of God as you understand in Christians is that God requires nothing because he is total. He is total. He is everything, right? And for that reason, the act of creation of creating the world is, as you can infer, a co-creation. Because as far as human experience is concerned, what you don't know doesn't exist. Are we together on this? If you're not aware of something, there's a likelihood it doesn't exist as far as human experience is concerned. And so what I'm trying to infer in creation is that there is an element of God sacrificing himself, a little bit of himself, so that something other than him can be. And this, I'm going to show this throughout creation and throughout being. There's an aspect of God withdrawing himself so that there can be existence of something else. Because the totality in which God is and the, the manner in which you're able to appreciate him is that he needs nothing else other than himself. He is total, he is full. And so the act of creating something that can be perceived, that is in the form of heavens, the earth, creating uh, the angels, creating Saturn himself, creating human beings, and much more so creating human beings as the ultimate manifestation, a lot of version though, al ultimate manifestation of his likeness. That aspect of creating something other than himself sort of required a withdrawal and a sacrifice of self. Point number two. The nature of creation is that um, from the very first instance where everything that God created was good, and there's confirmation of this from the Bible, after every day he created something, indeed he said it was good. We still pose with, again, a fundamental question of why evil exists. And as far as we're able to tell, having created a perfect universe, Evil reached out from beneath, you know, what we could say God's nose. And that is from his kingdom, there was someone in the name of Satan who was able to desire more than what was able to be, what was prescribed for him. He desired more than that. And as far as we Christians are able to tell, this is the first instance of evil. And it just cropped out from thin air. And there was a huge fight, we are told in the book of Isaiah, the fallen star. I think it's somewhere in Isaiah chapter 9. Mm, we are given the description of how there was a huge fight in heaven and how Satan and his, uh, his followers were cast out of heaven to keep the purity of heaven as is. And that happened fast forward to the creation of man and the fall of man having been created in a perfect scenario, an Eden, a walled garden. A paradise and given a choice of course man insisted on uh, doing it his own way and you get the initial the origin the original sin that man had and the fall of man and everything else from then on is the salvation of man and attempt to be able to to revert this initial relationship that was destroyed what am I trying to say there's a sacrifice of self in creation as far as I'm concerned with God in creating something, knowing very well that he is full, creating something else other than him that can be able to perceive him, there is an aspect of sacrifice that is involved in that, to be able to withdraw yourself so that something else can be. Two, in the manner in which God deals with 
evil by not, for example, if it were up to me, if I had created man and he decided to eat the food, I'd just snap and do and create one that will not do it. The easy version. But consistently, in the manner in which the first, for example, evil is manifested in God's kingdom, heaven, the desire for Satan to be somewhere he's not, the manner in which God deals with that, and also the manner in which God deals with the original sin, which is the sin that makes us human for eternity, suggests that, and it, this is what maybe allows God to lay a claim on being a judge, that the existence of God is outside of right and wrong. It is not as simple as right and wrong with God. And being the author of creation, he is outside of that, right and wrong. That is a simple analogy that you cannot frame God within. And that's why he has to be the judge. Because a judge, it's impossible for you to be a judge if you are within the frame of right and wrong. You cannot be a perfect judge if you're not. We go down. We are still working with the big picture. We walk down to um, the Israelites and the framing in which they needed to coexist with one another. And what I'm talking about is the Ten Commandments. And these were basic instructions to allow them to coexist with one another and much more so to coexist with God. And you fast forward all this to various conquests, various uh, uh, exiles that uh, the nation of Israel was, uh, was put up. And eventually we come to John the Baptist and this idea of Christ coming and him showing the way. And the manner in which um, John the Baptist prepares the way for the salvation, the eternal salvation, this being the eternal salvation of man, is the idea that um, it is all a personal experience. And the framing for him is through repentance. And it's a personal experience because this aspect of repentance can only be done by self. Previously it had all been done by, it was communal and it was done using representatives, but it was always the identity of the person who is doing this was always, was always transferred in the person that is doing this. So a nation is transferred, the identity of a nation is transferred to one person and, where, and thereby if that person confesses, it is as if the entire nation has, has confessed. But Christ came to ensure that we are able to transfer this transfer of identity from a nation to a person to self. And that's what Jeremiah is talking about when he says the laws will be written in their hearts. So why am I talking about all these patterns and asking people to put in their hard work or you know, reminding people that this journey of salvation is a personal journey and requires, uh, and requires uh, some personal input in the form of repentance? It is for the same reason that um, John the Baptist puts out. Sometimes we Christians fall in, into the temptation of being comfortable, being comfortable that there are people ahead of us, for example, who've done the hard work for our sake, and for that reason, we are redeemed. For the Israelites, it was uh, the patriarchs in the form of Abraham. And I keep reminding people that it's unbelievably difficult to understand the circumstances in which these people of old were navigating their life because they had no reference. They had no reference like we do it as the Bible. And it was extremely, an extremely personal experience that they had to go through. And I pose to you that a proper life within God also mimics this idea of being outside of right and wrong. The same way, this is me trying to paraphrase what Christ would say as the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. As Paul would have it, now that you have been saved, you're no longer under the law. You get? And this is me trying to rephrase that by saying that proper living within Christ, that is a proper navigation of self by sacrificing self in the manner in which God sacrificed a bit of self so that he can create something other than himself and is also visible by sacrificing himself by giving up his son so that his son can come to do the, the bidding of man even though he was not supposed to do that, that aspect of sacrificing 
is everything and all that we need so that we can be able to navigate life in Christ so that we can be in the realm of outside right and wrong. I'll continue to build my case. For the Israelites, they had become a bit, uh, a bit too comfortable, especially the Pharisees, the keepers of the law, um, because they were assured, quote unquote, and guaranteed that salvation would come their way thanks to the fact that Abraham was a friend of God, the father of faith. The laws in which they were observing, they would track a direct, a blood lineage to holy men. And for this reason, they had resorted into what would otherwise be the confines of culture as opposed to a religion, for example, a like Christianity. The confines of culture lay rest and comfort within the actions of people. And there is no future aspect of culture. It's stagnant and it's rigid. And this is what the Pharisees and the most Israelites were up to. And John the Baptist is constantly reminding them, you guys, you better watch out, because this constant um, comfort that you find in people that have already put in the hard work is not what is going to save you. That was them for them. It was Abraham. We are so distant from Abraham that it's almost impossible. We are not. It's not because we are virtuous that we do not misuse him. It's because we have no way of relating to him properly. Otherwise, if we had a chance, we would be misusing him as much as the Pharisees were doing. We, on the other hand, have we have another another problem, and the problem comes in the people who are authority figures in our lives. As far as uh, you know, the word is concerned, it could be the people who sit in front of you. You have the vicar, the lay readers. At home, you have, if you are married, your husband, your wife. If you are living on the roof of your parents, it's your parents. And the challenge for us is whenever these people ultimately become the others of what is right and wrong, to the point that you cannot be, be able to divorce right and wrong from the person, as much as the Israelites and the Pharisees took pride in the actions of their patriarchs, Jacob, Moses, Abraham, and they could no longer divorce the individual actions that these guys went through as a saving act for themselves and their nation, they cannot be able to divorce that from themselves. Whenever we find ourselves in that space, then we need to call ourselves to a Kutano and remind ourselves that the path to navigate so that we can be in the realm of what is outside right and wrong so that we can be in the realm of what is good as God proclaimed as he was creating. Every day he created and it was good. It was not right, it was not bad, it is outside of that realm, that's what I'm trying to say. It was good. For you to be able to navigate life through that narrow road, the eye of the needle, as Christ puts it, you have to continuously remind yourself that it's a sacrifice, sacrificial journey. And the sacrificial journey is, is as such, that you're constantly going to lose yourself so that you can be able to bring in and incorporate something new into you. And this ever continuous activity of sacrifice, sacrificing what you know, sacrificing yourself so that you can be able to accommodate something else as God did during creation, the initial creation, being able to sacrifice himself so that there can be the existence of something else. Okay? Every time that you through life, you navigate the life using this principle of sacrificing, repenting, and what actually does repenting mean? It means that you've done something ideally wrong, but so that you can be able to rise above it, you've been able to see that it's not in tandem with how you're supposed to behave. And for this reason, you're able to acknowledge that as a first step, and two, and move beyond repeating that thing that way, a bit of you have, has died, a bit of you has been sacrificed, so that a new concept, a new identity can be able to be accommodated in you. Ultimately mimicking the idea, the idea that God had when he created man in his own likeness, in his, in his own image. And this continuous action of sacrificing, incorporating you, sacrificing, incorporating you, 
this should be the identity that you find, especially so that we take after after Christ. It makes no, it's ridiculous to think that in his comfort, God being in heaven and being the author of all creation, among all the options that he had, the option that he so best fit to take is to, to come and live on earth and be able to save man the man he did. It's the most absurd thing to think. But this continuous action of God from creation, from the man in which Christ lived, to continuously sacrifice himself so that he can be able to accommodate, especially so in God's teaching, the less fortunate, uh, the, the trodden in life, the poor, the tax collectors, all the misfortunes of society. The continuous act action of God himself to sacrifice himself to be able to accommodate these people. And this being the propulsion of his life, that was his identity. And nothing means more to us to be like Christ than that, to continuously sacrifice ourselves to accommodate new ideas and to ensure that that identity of va a value system does not rest in any one person any longer than they have to. For example, I'm seated here, I'm standing here, sorry, and for this brief moment, I'm the vessel of Christ in dispatching the word. But that's it. The word should be more alive than I am, and I should not take precedence in for example, in your life, thinking that I am the author of some value system. I am not. By the time I'm out of this place, I'm more like you, not worse. You know? And this should be our mantra. Moving forward, continue sacrifice in the manner in which Christ taught us to repent. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we've heard from you, dear, and we are thankful. We appreciate you, Heavenly Father, that you've been able to instruct us, dear Heavenly Father using a pattern in our lives. First was God the Father, you sent Jesus Christ the Son, and you've sent the Holy Spirit in us. Much more so you've been a blessing in our lives by giving us parents, guardians, you've given us people who are standing for you in the form of priest, O oh Lord, and you've been able to learn a lot, dear Holy Father. Much more so it is a humble request that moving forward, dear Holy Father, we're able to take up these values and truth that you and Father have been bestowed upon us and the, and the people that you set upon our lives as our own, O Lord, and that we may be brave enough, dear Father, to continuously give up ourselves, sacrifice a little bit of ourselves so that we can be able to become something new. It is a humble request, dear Father, that in salvation we are supposed to become new creatures and that this becomes the mantra of our lives. Much more so, we are, we are humbly requesting that this truth may be inducted in our hearts, installed in our hearts, and that may be a light to the world. This we pray, trusting and believing in Jesus' holy name.